the amendment that was moved in the House of Lords earlier this week, Amendment 97ZA, has sadly been withdrawn by Lord Blencathra because he didn't feel there was enough support to actually successfully amend the Police Crime Bill with this um, new paragraph. Uh, I think this was a really significant intervention into this bill and so we're going to look in some detail at some of the speeches in a little series, put it on a playlist. So first up, let's look at Lord Blencathra introducing Amendment 97ZA in the House of Lords on the 10th of January 2022. Hey Lord Blencathra. My new amendment, number 97ZA. My original amendment at committee stage was unbalanced. I accept that. I sought to protect female offenders, but neglected to account for the small minority of trans women who might face unacceptable risk if housed in male prisons. My new amendment aims to afford appropriate protection to all prisoners, notwithstanding that there can be no guarantee that every prisoner will be entirely protected from risk, even within their own single-sex units. Now, I do wish to thank my noble friend, the Lord Wolfson, for our meetings, for the teaching he organised, and for our ongoing discussions. Now, your Lordships may ask, why have I brought back an amendment? Because this is an important issue in its own right. The needs of women in prison matter, and these needs mandate single-sex provision. Women in prison are acknowledged to be an exceptionally vulnerable group, and cannot simply choose to use a different space which remains single-sex. Now, these re reasons were discussed in the previous debate, and I shall not repeat them. But this is also representative of the wider issue, my lords, that of the ability of legislation to maintain single-sex spaces for women. The female estate is a definitive example of a space that should be single-sex. If women in prison cannot be guaranteed single-sex spaces, then no woman or girl can. Hospital wards, changing rooms, rape crisis centre, refugees, toilets and schools, anywhere where women and girls, for reason of dignity, privacy and safety, require single-sex spaces. And I simply say this to my noble friend. If legislation is insufficient at the moment to secure single-sex provision for women in prison, then all females in this country are left vulnerable. Since my previous amendment, I have received a great many letters from both men and women an amendment to secure the rights of women in prison to single-sex spaces has wide support across a cross-section of the general public. Media coverage continually indicates that the general public supports single-sex spaces for women and girls. Most recently, the article last week in The Times by, Jackie, by my, my, noble fr my honourable friend, uh, Jackie Doyle Price MP, called for women's prisons to become single-sex once more. Quite rightly, People see this as an important issue in its own right, but they recognise that it is representative of the wider issue. This amendment matters not just to women in prison, but for all women and girls. The strength of evidence indicates that male and female prisoners should be housed separately. This is normal international practice, including our own prison rules. Now, when the policies that permit some trans women prisoners, who are, of course, are of the male sex, to be housed alongside women in the female estate were put in place. This was essentially a live experiment a few years ago. It was not grounded in data. No data demonstrated that the acceptability or the impact on women in prison and on the operation of the female estate. In fact, research recently conducted on behalf of the Scottish Prison Service demonstrates that female offenders are negatively impacted when they're housed with trans women prisoners. This is notwithstanding the MOJ assertion that operational staff perceive that the policies are working well. Now, I am very pleased that the Ministry of Justice has committed to exploring opportunities uh, for research in this area. It was also clear, my Lords, from the teaching uh, that the MOJ believes that the ability to act differently to the current policies is constrained by current legislation. I shall not argue on this point, but if real change is to be effected, then legislative change is or may be necessary. Now, the purpose of the Gender Recognition Act was to legally recognise the acquired gender of transsexual people in specific sets of circumstances in line with a judgment of the European Court of Human Rights. 
The GRA contains within it supplementary provisions in sections 23 and 24, which empower the Secretary of State to modify the effect of a gender recognition certificate by order. As the explanatory notes to the GRA acknowledge the possibility that, at the time of passing of the GRA, there were circumstances where its unintended consequences for people might not have been then realised. I suggest, my lords, that the allocation of trans women prisoners with a GRC to the female estate is one such situation, and that legislation to exclude these prisoners from the female prison estate on the basis of their sex, not their gender reassignment, is both possible and warranted. The intention of the GRA was not to render the provisions of separate, uh, separate sex and single sex services for females an impossibility to replace sex with gender or to deny the sex differences between men and women. Neither was the inclusion of gender reassignment protection as a separate protected characteristic in the Equality Act of 2010. The undesirability of that uh, should be self-evident, my lords. Now, a variety of concerns in respect to the previous amendment were raised by noble lords at, and at the teaching we had. These related to the vulnerability of trans women and their safety, the ability of trans women to live in their acquired gender, and the undesirability of housing trans women prisoners far from their families. My Lords, no one wishes to place any prisoner at an acceptable risk of harm. Vulnerability exists through the male estate, and although female offenders characteristically exhibit particular vulnerabilities, this does not exclude the possibility that the vulnerability of some male prisoners, including trans women, may be equally high. The question for all of us is how to keep trans women safe, and that's very important. However, that is wholly separate to the question, who has the legitimate entitlement to be housed in the female estate? I accept, my lords, that for some trans women, allocation to the male estate will not be appropriate and should not happen. My revised amendment means that Her Majesty's Prison Service will be able to assess trans women on a case-by-case -case basis and make decisions concerning allocation in consideration of all known risks. The wishes of the individual prisoner can be considered, at the, as in the present policy, concerning transgender prisoners. Where a prisoner cannot be housed safely in either the general population of the male estate or with other males on a vulnerable prisoner's unit, the decision can be made to house that prisoner in a specialist transgender unit. This will ensure their safety from male prisoners. There will be no access to or association with female prisoners. That would not be possible. But access to women in prison is not needed to keep these prisoners safe. It is removing them from the presence of men that is required to keep them safe, not putting them in a woman's prison. Now, I note that the MOJ states that 94 per cent of trans women are housed on the male estate. This means that the safety of the overwhelming majority of trans women can be met in men's prisons. Now, again, at the teaching, the Ministry of Justice indicated that trans women may obtain a GRC whilst housed in the male estate. It would seem, my lords, that means that they are able to satisfy the requirement of living as a woman for a period of two years to the satisfaction of the Gender Recognition Panel. The overwhelming majority of trans women are housed in the male estate, meaning that their needs of women and their rights to live in their acquired agenda can be met in men's prison. Certainly, specialist transgender units for women, which I advocate, should be run according to the female regime and providing the canteen for female prisons. A concern was also raised that dedicated transgender units would leave trans women far from their families. Now, this is not an issue that only affects trans women. A 2016 HM Her Majesty's Inspector of Prisons report found that distance from family was a common barrier to visits throughout the prison estate. Women are particularly affected. There are around ten times the number of men's prisons in England and Wales than women's prisons, and female offenders are more likely to be held at a distance from their families than men. A 2019 report stated that women are typically held at distances that are over 20 per cent further away from their families than men. Some women are held at considerable distances from their families. As there is no female prison in Wales, women may be held over 150 miles from home. Prisoner allocation to specialist units may take place even though this results in increased distance from family. Allocation of trans women to E-Wing at Downview is an example. Trans women prisoners who find themselves housed far away from family should be assisted.
Financial help is already available from the Assisted Prison Visit Unit to facilitate visits from close relatives and partners of prisoners who are on low income. I propose expanding this provision for trans women who are held far from family. The number of trans women prisoners currently held in the female state is very small, suggesting that the number who may be held on specialist trans un transgender units would also be very, very small. The additional financial costs would therefore be modest indeed. The transgender prison population is growing, my lords. Data released by the MOJ at the end of last year indicate a 20% increase in the population of transgender prisoners since 2019. Their needs in prison will become more pressing. The commitment to building new estate, as outlined in the Prisons White Paper, provides the opportunity to provide that gen transgender prisoners are properly uh, 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 and appropriately accommodated. New secure, secure units can be tailored to their needs and vulnerabilities. These needs and the operation of specialist transgender units should be a focal point for the so-called future regime design with outcome frameworks uh, to reflect this. As part of the trauma-responsive approach to women's custody and the female offender strategy, we must recommit to keeping women's prisons single sex. My Lords, I conclude with a quote from page 54 of the new Prisons White Paper. It says, quote, We know that women in prison need to address the trauma and its effects if they are to engage with rehabilitative services to turn their lives around, unquote. My Lords, I submit that the possibility for rehabilitation of female offenders should not be compromised. My Lords, it does not turn their lives around if, as was acknowledged in the judgment of, of FDJ versus SSJ, these women are living in a state of fear and anxiety. My amendment ensures that the needs for privacy, dignity and safety of all prisoners it can be met. I commend my amendment to the House. Amendment proposed. Insert the following. At the end of the debate, Lord Blen Cathra sadly withdrew this amendment. Um, he wasn't able to get the support he needs, but he is not going to give up. Anyway, let's watch him making his speech to withdraw the amendment. My Lords, as is normal, uh, one winding up says it's been an interesting debate. Well, it certainly provoked uh, more interest uh, than I had anticipated. And I wish to thank all my noble friends, Lord Cormac, Lord Farmer, uh, Baroness Mayor, uh, Baroness Fox, Baroness Jones, for the contributions. But first of all, can I start off with the contribution of my noble friend, Lord Herbert? I don't do media. I don't do uh, uh, social, uh, uh, anti-social media things like Twitter and so on. I'm not motivated to move this out of ideology, nor because of what the media say. I'm motivated to do this uh, because I've been approached by women in prison who were afraid, afraid for their safety, rightly or wrongly. Now, he's right to say that it's only a small number of, transgender, trans, uh, of, of trans women in prisons, but there's a large number of women who are afraid of them. They may be wrong to be afraid, but, it's in, but it is in their interest that I'm working to try and make sure that they no longer have that fear. Now, the noble lord, a noble and learned lord, Lord Panic, has said that my amendment uh, would mean that um, uh, trans uh, women in prison, transgender prisoners, should either be stuffed into the male estate or put into some ghastly, specially segregated facility. He made it sound like something uh, that the apartheid regime would invent. Well, my lords, that's exactly what the current government policy is, the MOJ policy is. All, all transgender prisoners coming into the prison estate start off in the male estate. I'm not inventing that. That's the current policy, as my noble friend has said. 90% of trans women prisoners stay in the male estate, and then some are moved uh, to the women's estate and they're moved to a specially segregated facility uh, called E-Wing of Downview. And I'm merely suggesting in my amendment those, uh, that, uh, that the facilities of E-Wing in Downview should be extended to house more uh, transgender prisoners. Now, the noble and learned Lord of Hope of Craighead, uh, I'm sorry, also, and also the noble Lord, Lord Panic, I think are acting under the impression that the vast majority of these prisoners have spent a long part of their life as trans women, that they've had hormone replacement therapy, that they've had operations, they've been living as a woman for years. 
That is not the case, my lords. As we've seen from Scotland, only one in 12 has. We don't have the figures for England because they're, they're confidential and understandably, but the anecdotal evidence is that there is no one in our prisons in England with a GRC who has gone through that process. So they are not those who have lived their lives 20 or 30 years. But I do say to the noble and learned Lord of Craighead, uh, Lord Hope of Craighead, if the government were to go down my route, then I perfectly well accept that a system could be built in where someone who has had hormone replacement therapy, who has had, had, had surgery, who has been living as a woman for X number of years, that that person may then qualify on a risk assessment basis to be classified as a woman, not in biological terms, but in terms of being sent to prison. And I finally say to the, to, to the noble Lord, Lord Cashman, it is quite wrong to categorise this amendment as stigmatising trans people as a particularly violent class. That is not the case. I made absolutely clear in my speech that, that trans women prisoners, many of them, could not stay in the male estate because the male prisoners would be violent towards them. They are equally capable or more capable uh, of, of violence. Now, uh, I accept that the court said that um, what the prison service is doing is lawful. Well, in the narrow point of law considered by the court, that's correct. And I would hope that the MOG would, MOG would not have a policy that deliberately broke the, broke the law. But the point of issue here, my lords, is not our ideology. It's that what is lawful and what is morally right uh, part ways. And I do urge the MOG to accept my solution, which lets trans women prisoners live their lives in prison in safe space and women in theirs. And I simply do not understand why uh, the Lib Dems and, and the Labour Party and some of my own noble friends now dislike women so much that they're resolutely opposed to defending their hard-won rights. Now, I can see how the government has blundered into this hole, uh, but at least I see signs now from the government party that they've stopped digging. My lords, I'm not going to be successful today, but I say to all my noble friends on the front bench, in all departments, that this policy of downgrading the rights of biological sex women is heading for the scrap heap of history. It's not on the side of science, logic, morality, nor common sense. And everyone outside the political bubble we're in knows that. <coughs> the battle for common sense and the rights of women will intensify. And I conclude by suggesting that all my noble friends should read, and all ministers, should read the excellent article in the Times last week by my honourable friend, Jackie Doyle Price, MP. She said in Teralia, quote, sex is biological and immutable, gender is social. The two things are distinct, and by conflating sex with gender, we have created, created an inevitable conflict between rights based on sex and those assumed by someone with a transgender identity. She said, we can be inclusive without compromising the rights, dignity, and privacy of women, unquote. Wise words, my lord. Jackie Doll Price is on the side of common sense and history. So I beg leave to withdraw my amendment, not because I'm wrong, but because I cannot win in the numbers tonight. <laughs> is it your Lordship's? Lord Blencathra is not going to give up. I had a look at his history of speeches and written questions, which is available in the description box. And he has made interventions around this issue many times over the past several years. And he is a conservative life peer. So um, we're now in a situation in the UK where the left has abandoned women to such a degree that we're grateful for unelected life peers that are appointed by the Conservative Party in the House of Lords to defend our rights. So there are feminists that believe that we shouldn't ally with anybody on the right wing of politics. And um, I respect those women have boundaries. I respect the historical traditions of radical feminism, which come out of a, a left wing Marxist materialist analysis of class relations. But, you know, in the 60s and 70s, it was because of the intransigence of left wing men that meant that women's issues were never being discussed or given the prominence that they deserved, that radical and revolutionary strands of feminism were born. It could be that we're back here again. Lord Blencathra has stood up for women time and again. Here's a little clip of him standing up and explaining 
why a man is speaking up for women in the House of Lords. And I would say to the noble Baroness, Baroness Chakrabarty, the reason so many men spoke is because there are so many Baronesses who normally sit behind her who are afraid to speak on this issue. They've spoken to me privately, as I've some on the Lib Dem benches and cross benches, and they said, please raise this issue, we dare not speak out. Now, that is not right. It should be possible for Baronesses on all sides of this House to raise this issue of women's rights. We're going to take a look at several of the contributions that were made during that debate. There were some extraordinary statements made. Um, some were wonderful, too. Uh, anyway, today we're looking at Lord Blaine Cathra, and I hope you've enjoyed this little summary of his contribution in that debate. If you would like to contact him, all you need to do is pop a letter in an envelope with Lord Bel Blen Cathra, House of Lords. It'll get to him. There is a postcode too. I'll put the addresses up for you now. Um, do get in touch and let him know that this work is appreciated. Thanks for watching. Please do like, dislike, subscribe, share the videos, share the love. Come back for the next video in the series.